is yours. Kia ora Hans, um, thank you so much. Kia ora Kota. good evening from the future, from our beautiful Golden Bay in Aotearoa, New Zealand. It's winter here. Um, I'm Dr. C. Rotman, and um, it's really great being back on the Users Academy with another webinar about our how to reach energy users task. And, oh, why is it now not moving? It's just, yeah. Um, so the talk outline will be a quick overview of the four plus years of research that we've undertaken in phase one of this task, which includes some insights from field pilots and research learnings, some recommendations before we zoom out into the bigger picture to touch on the global energy crisis and before finishing up with a quick introduction of how we're hoping to address energy injustice with phase two of our research collaboration. Um, so first, some highlights from phase one. Um, this task has evolved from over 12 years of research with the users TCP. We started off with task 24, which was called behavior change in DSM, and it focused on various theories and models and disciplines and how they all could be applied in the real world. And we largely agreed with George Box that all models are wrong, but some of them are useful. Um, and that it really was all about context um, rather than picking the right disciplinary approach or theory, and that the humans within the energy system were actually the most important part of developing strategies that work. Um, we also learned in this task that we're dealing with highly complex rather than complicated systems here, and that means that computational power alone will not be able to help solve these problems. So in phase two of task 24, it really was all about the people, the energy end users, of course, but more importantly, we focused on how we could facilitate multi-stakeholder collaboration and breaking down the silos and ivory towers that we're so often forced into in the energy system. And for that, we did field research testing and relied very much on the power of storytelling amongst other tools. And the highlight of this um, phase was really co-editing a highly influential energy research and social science special issue on narratives and storytelling in energy research and climate re um, change research. And the introductory paper of that has garnered over 400 citations to date and means that a lot more researchers are now using storytelling and narratives in their work, which is great. Um, then, thanks to the US Consortium for Energy Efficiency joining our research in 2018, we learned about underserved energy users who are often called hard to reach. Um, and so our current task delved really deeply into characterizing these audiences and to our great shock and dismay, we found that a lot more than our hypothesized 30% of energy users likely fall under these categories. And doing this research, we realized that just focusing on the symptoms of energy hardship or poverty was never going to help us provide long lasting solutions that address the root cause. And so heading into phase two of this work, we will address underlying causes for energy injustice, including those um, arising from unintended, unintended consequences and focus in on hidden energy users who have historically been the most underserved. So, um, our definition of how to reach energy users in this task is very broad, and that is on purpose, because most people think of them um, mainly as lower income households who live in energy poverty, but it's actually a lot more complex than that. So vulnerable households are not just those who are low income, but also those who suffer from various intersectionalities and compounding factors of hardship. And then there's also higher income energy users who consume a lot, but are not usually targeted by any programs. There's also commercial and residential renters and their landlords, which is over 60% of our building stock in the world, and especially small businesses, which are over 97% of the commercial sector, and all of them are hard to reach for different reasons. Um, so a quick shout out to our wonderful participants and partners. Um, our funders and national experts are here in purple, our project partners in green, and our co-funders and collaborators for field research and pilots in gray. And then in orange on this world map, you can see the many scientists and energy hardship experts from all over the world who have provided us so kindly with in-kind feedback and advice. And Nami Hinui, a huge thank you to all of you. Couldn't have done it without you. Um, so through our awesome project partner, the Sea Change Institute's involvement, um, we have created the co-created the research process that we're testing and validating in this task. And you're going to hear a fair bit about this. 
um, and that um, is not we're not just running our whole task chronologically according to this process, but we also used it in field research. We called it the building blocks of behavior change. It's based on design thinking combined with really robust social science um, methodology and triangulating quantitative and quantitative uh, qualitative data. Um, and so in year one, we undertook in-depth expert interviews and surveys and decided on our shared goals and objectives in the discover phase, really got um, a hold of what the why was for this research. Then we undertook a really detailed literature review on defining how to reach audiences and behaviors in year one and two. In year two, we really honed in on the design phase and undertook case study analyses in eight, in eight countries to gain insights into engagement strategies and deliveries, what worked and what didn't and why. And we're about to publish a cross-country case study comparison about this work in energy research and social sciences. And then in year three and four, we really focused in on that deploy phase on the right there where we actually co-designed, implemented and evaluated field pilots in Aotearoa, New Zealand and Canada, and also undertook field research with how to reach utility customers in the US. Um, so uh, these next few slides are largely to provide you links to our many publications for each of those building block phases that I just talked about. So I'll go quite fast. This was our work in year one, in year two, which is when COVID hit, um, we accidentally in lockdown ended up writing a book, which we called The Beast, um, where we reviewed over a thousand publications to do what is probably the meatiest and most important publication of this task. And just some uh, highlight findings of this, um, probably the most in-depth audience character uh, characterization effort of how to reach energy users to date. Um, we really got to point out that the term hard to reach is very problematic as it seems to put the whole owners on the energy users rather than those of us who are trying to reach them, um, often unsuccessfully. And so in this book, we outlined the various critiques and other definitions, none of which are perfect, unfortunately, and also provide a glossary of terms. And then looking at the size of our different audience chapters and the number of papers that we found, it became clear that the vast majority of the hard to reach literature really focused on low income households and also residential renters. And that the biggest gaps were uh, on research that focuses on interventions targeting small to medium enterprises, high income, high consuming households, commercial energy managers and building operators and marginalized or hidden energy users. And um, as I said, what was really shocking to us was that the audience size was a lot larger than we thought. At least two thirds of energy users, if not more, aren't being targeted effectively or at least, um, uh, you know, well at all with the current engagement strategies, programs and interventions that are out there. And that's, of course, a real problem when changing energy using behaviors and demand side management is seen as one of the major solutions to deal with the energy crisis that we're in. Um, a gap analysis of the research showed that there is not enough psychographic data being collected. Um, we focus more on barriers than needs. Uh, energy behaviors are often not clearly described or targeted. The audience voice and input is usually missing when interventions are designed in a very top-down fashion by experts who often lack the insights into their targets lived experiences and also non-energy impacts are often largely ignored. So um, here are the links to the 19 in-depth case studies from eight countries that delved into which engagement strategies worked in both the residential and non-residential sectors and why. And on the bottom there is also a link of a review that I recently did for the New Zealand government um, looking at 68 international energy hardship programs. So if you work in this field, there's probably a lot of um, quite meaty research there for you to look at. Um, from this year two case study analysis and cross-country comparison, um, some of the common engagement strategies, um, there is a clear winner when it comes to effectively engaging the hard to reach, and that is using trusted middle actors and community navigators and frontline and service providers. Um, they can help identify, recruit and engage those energy users. Um, it's really important to involve these partners in proper co-design, not just consultation. Um, that sometimes means that you have to provide them with training and improve their energy literacy as well so that they can help their families and clients understand why energy efficiency or demand side management is important and can help, um, help improve their lives and well-being. They're very often not energy professionals. 
Um, it was also clear that face-to-face -face and tailored in-home advice is the most effective, if quite resource intensive way to meet those audiences. Um, but it also helps you then really understand what their needs are and what their barriers are by being in their homes and um, talking to them in person and hearing their stories. Um, and it's also really important to note that energy efficiency or kilowatt hour savings really often not the most effective message to motivate those um, energy users. Instead, it would be a lot better to tailor the message that is based on, you know, the values and needs, which you hopefully had some time um, understanding, being in more direct contact with them, and then also really particularly highlighting how it can actually improve their family's health and well-being. Um, that's often more, much more effective. So in year three and four, we focused on field research and pilots. I'll spend uh, no time talking about the field research, uh, although it did really also underpin everything that we saw in, from the literature review and our case study analyses and cross-country comparisons. Um, so uh, that was just really supportive to that. I will focus a little bit more on the field pilots. We did one on uh, commercial energy managers and building operators in Canada and two in the residential sector in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, so the um, non-residential field pilot was funded in 2019 by the Independent Electricity Systems Operator of Ontario. And we did it with the Sea Change Institute again, um, where I'm a, um, who are a project partner, but I'm also a senior research associate there. And we developed a training pilot for energy managers and building operators, um, particularly in the underserved MUSH or municipalities, universities, schools, and hospital sector. And we not only used our building blocks framework to design, deliver, and evaluate the pilot, but we also taught it to our students. Uh, it was really successful. It was oversubscribed. We had 38 attendees, um, still in touch with some of them. Um, they um, came to Toronto from all over Ontario. We did two days of pretty intensive training and then eight weeks of online two-hour weekly coaching sessions where we worked through specific problems that they encountered in their daily lives or in the working lives. And then unfortunately COVID put a hold to uh, in-person training for a while, but we did also train uh, 20 workshop attendees at the Behaviour, Energy and Climate Change Conference in 2019. And more importantly, um, some of these findings have been incorporated by um, Lawrence Berkeley's National Lab in their update of the IESO 50001 Ready Navigator training. And that's being rolled out to US government employees in a whole lot of different departments. Um, so that's great to see. In Aotearoa, New Zealand, uh, the two largest utilities, or gen tailors as we call them, because they're generators and retailers, um, realized that they needed to do more to support their customers suffering from energy hardship, and that they both had a lot in common in terms of their focus on customer care. And so again, um, they hired me uh, and we followed our building blocks process, which led us to a really amazing outreach and collaboration with over 100 community groups in Wellington and Auckland, especially Indigenous and minority voices were represented there and their strong guidance and passion led the industry to agree to focus on their most marginalised and stigmatised customers for this pilot, um, who are those who remain hidden often on purpose and for a good reason, like experiencing shame, guilt, embarrassment, stigma and fear or not wanting to be a burden. Um, we undertook quite a lot of research, including empathy interviews with energy users who suffer in hidden hardship, as well as industry frontline customer care staff. And we surveyed those community providers who helped the most marginalized groups of society. And together we came up with over 70 actions, many of which are now going to be implemented by industry. So again, real world um, practical example of how this can work. Um, finally, I'd like to go a little bit into more detail about a pilot that was funded by the New Zealand government's support for energy education in communities program and um, since researching these kits as part of my task 24 research in Ireland and Aotearoa I've been totally obsessed with them and trying to figure out how to improve them because I realized that those home energy assessment toolkits which are loaned out by libraries all over the world are not really that great at showing that they have actually changed behaviors, nor are they really targeted at hard to reach and vulnerable energy users. Um, and so 
Again, we followed our building blocks process, no surprise there. Um, in the discover phase, we did a big landscape and stakeholder assessment, which included co-design workshops. Um, we developed shared goals again and the eligibility criteria with our community partners who were a sustainability trust, a social housing provider and two large Pacifica churches. Um, in the defined phase, we defined our target audiences as having low income with at least three compounding vulnerabilities, such as um, really young children, elderly, single parents or pregnant women, Maori and Pacifica, immigrants and refugees, including those who struggled with the language, mentally or physically disabled or suffering from chronic illness, especially respiratory illness, formerly homeless or ex-convicts, social housing tenants and other renters, et cetera. Um, we also defined our target behaviors based on a very specialized home performance advisor training that we delivered to our community partners. There's a link down there. It's called the Making Energy Work for Fano training. And um, in this training, because energy efficiency and, and, and healthy housing advice can be really technical and these people did not come from a technical background, so um, they really put, the, in, to make it easy, they kind of put energy use in a house into three buckets. So there is a healthy bucket, there is the hot water bucket, and there is the lighting and appliance bucket. And so we formed our um, behavioral advice in home around the concept of those three buckets, where we specifically talked about how they could minimize some of the energy use and reduce their bills by um, switching things off or swapping, you know, them out for more energy efficient uh, appliances in the hot water and lights and appliance bucket. But then we wanted them to prioritize any of the savings into the healthy bucket, which was really around heating, ventilation, uh, reducing dampness and mold and moisture, etc. cetera. Um, so it was very focused on healthy housing. Uh, in the co-design phase, um, which probably took the longest, partly because COVID finally hit New Zealand after two years of being blissfully, you know, uh, unencumbered by it mostly, um, we really wanted to get that right. Um, so we focused on the kids' contents with our community providers and technical experts, and also the content of the instruction manuals, which kept being revised to be simpler and simpler and less jargony. Um, with every revision and also the activity booklets that were left with households for a two-week period to use the kits and follow activities with. Um, a really good example uh, of how important this phase was and how important it is to listen and learn from our community partners rather than relying on what we thought was the right way to engage um, Fana or families was that we designed a whole lot of games and activities around the idea of vampire energy which is really commonly used in North America to describe wasted power from appliances on standby. And I love Buffy the Vampire Slayer, so I was super excited about this. But um, when we showed this to our Pacifica church partners, they were really horrified that we would talk about vampire hunting with their families and children. And so um, we changed the design to power sucking Namu. Um, which are sand flies and mosquitoes. And instead of the vampires, we created little stickers for kids to hunt for and put on power sucking appliances in their homes. So that's just one example of where we really learned from our community partners. So during the deploy phase, um, we recruited 45 families um, with help of our community partners. We dropped the heat kits off to them and we spent about an hour with the households to understand their current energy behaviors, what they knew about energy already, their motivations, attitudes, what appliances they had and what uh, state their homes were in. And then they used the tools for two weeks um, to do the activities, the read the stories, do the quizzes and games, um, fill out the data and measurements. It only took about five to 10 minutes a day. After two weeks, we picked um, the kids up uh, did an exit interview, usually took about half an hour, where we wanted to find out, you know, what worked, what didn't, what they liked, what didn't like, if their energy knowledge improved, um, if, if that what behaviors have changed, etc. And then um, we handed out some prizes and um, called them again after four months to find out if there was any behavioral persistence or long-term change. 
So we were hoping for a 10% completion rate because, as I said, these were really vulnerable households. Um, but we were absolutely delighted that we managed to get a hundred percent success rate, all 45 households completed all of the activities, um, even though many of them thought that they would just go into a price draw rather re than receiving the full price package of um, $500 of energy efficiency tools and solutions that address the problems that they measured themselves. So we had a hundred percent completion rate. Um, um, all participants received a $500 tailored price package. Um, we it was really resource intensive because we did collect and analyze a ton of data. Um, but most of them said they'd recommend the kit or have already recommended it. 85% said that they reported significant improvements to the home and the health. 90% said the bills were lower and 70% said by more than $50 a month. And that was in summer. And that is absolutely huge for those families. 85% um, are still thinking about energy efficiency and healthy housing. 65% said that their other household members are too, because that was often a big barrier, getting the kids and the husbands and the other household members involved. And we even could show that the actual bedroom temperatures rose over the course of this pilot by over two degrees and the average humidity dropped. Um, so um, we could prove that this approach really worked, that it did put, show behavioral persistence over the four months. Um, and now we're talking to program managers in both um, Aotearoa New Zealand and also in Ireland, and even um, so a utility in Canada on how we can potentially improve and scale up their um, current library kits and um, figure out how we can roll out this program further. So super excited about this. Now, um, what are some of the major learnings and recommendations coming out of this huge amount of research and data? Um, I was asked by the IEA um, to be part of a special workshop on reducing energy demand with behavior and awareness campaigns. And I put a link in there um, of my talk where I, I was, I kind of had to say that, you know, a lot of the great campaigns and national marketing and rollouts that they had, and showcased all over the world didn't really address um, the heart to reach. So we got to do better for them. The original question that I posted was, are they really hard to reach or are we not doing enough? Well, yes, they are extremely hard to reach, especially once you go below low income as a, a, de a denominator for them um, into the more um, complex and compounding vulnerabilities that they often face. Um, identifying and recruiting them is really, really hard, both in the residential and commercial sectors. For example, we sent out over 20,000 emails to small businesses in the US to achieve 20 interviews for um, Applied as part of that customer research. Uh, and and in, the, uh, in the end, half of them were actually recruited by word of mouth and snowball sampling and already established relationships. Um, in the non-residential sector, it's really up to industry to do a lot better and focus programs not just on large commercial industrial and residential but particularly on those um, small to medium enterprises and businesses and in the residential sector um, it's almost impossible to effectively engage vulnerable households without trusted middle actors such as community and frontline and service providers however they are also extremely hard to reach they are also often really mistrustful of our intentions. And so there's lack of trust and a very low level of energy literacy in general. And that includes the small business sector, as we found. We're clearly the biggest barriers, um, which means that the current engagement approaches like mass marketing campaigns and information pamphlets or surveys just don't work for them. Um, because for them, it's not just about being aware or willing to change it's often about survival and about making those horrible choices like shall we heat or eat or heat or pay rent instead and so clearly as a society we have failed those energy users and if we want to truly combat the global energy crisis and have a just and sustainable energy transition we've got to do a lot better so um Four headline recommendations from phase one. Um, we really need to listen and understand first before we go into fixing and coming up with strategies and solutions. If we really want to help those who suffer the most and who need urgent interventions and help, we need to ask them and their trusted support groups and communities how this help should be offered. 
Um, otherwise, it's just more Band-Aid solutions and ambulances at the bottom of the cliff or worse, mass freezing, starving and death, even in our Western societies who are struggling with the poly crisis that we're facing. Um, this is probably the single most important relationship that we learned reviewing vast amounts of literature and doing case study analyses and field research around the globe. And that is you need to build trusted long-term relationships um, with those people who are have, who have access to those hard to reach energy users. Um, but they are also extremely hard to reach, um, especially those of us to those of us who are locked in our silos. Um, it takes a lot of time and resources to build those trusted relationships. And they, those frontline heroes, we need to acknowledge they're super underpaid, overworked, undervalued by society, and whatever additional burden we place upon them needs to be really carefully considered. Because what we can do is we actually may re reduce their trust and mana or respect within their own communities if they're seen to like, you know, fraternize with the enemy. So all of this needs to be um, addressed really carefully. That also leads to the next point, which is that we really need to acknowledge our own internalized biases and privilege because the standards of professionalism are very heavily defined by our Eurocentric culture. That includes the energy system. And we've really institutionalized whiteness and Westerners as normal and you know, superior. And that informs our intervention design and our engagement strategies. But it's close to impossible to accurately characterize or define a target audience if our gender, ethnicity, or class status means that we have little insights or understanding of the lived experience. And um, you know, the energy system and energy research is very white, very male, very middle class, very European, North American dominated. And we've really, you know, followed a lot of silver bullet solutions presented by the engineering sciences, by economists and technologists for over half a century, and the system is clearly failing. And so maybe it's time that we listen to some social scientists and non-Western and otherwise minority experts who have received so much less of the research funding and attention of decision makers. I think we've got a lot to learn there. And um, finally, it's really important to follow a strong co-design process and not start with the engagement strategy or design element without having done our homework first. That means spending some time and resources on landscape stakeholder assessment to see what's already known and clearly defining our target audiences and behaviors because they're usually a lot more complex than we think. However, the best way to solve any problem is to remove its cause and the cause for so many energy users being hard to reach without bus uh, business as usual engagement strategies is the energy quadrilemma. And until we confront this issue head on, we really got to ask ourselves if there really can be a just energy transition for all. And so I'm going to zoom out very quickly and have a look at this idea around why energy justice is important and what it is. I'm sure you've got You've seen this image at some stage, like with the hard to reach terminology, it's important that we distinguish equality, equity, and justice. Equality is around evenly distributed tools and assistance, but it doesn't account for structural and systemic inequalities. Equity refers to the creation of custom tools that uh, address those inequalities, but energy justice focuses on the system and providing the tools. Um, and even though what I'm going to say may sound a little bit critical, especially of policymakers, I was one for seven years and I very much know how complex and hard it is to try and formulate energy policy. But um, the current clear conceptual example of this complexity is via the energy trilemma, where there are competing forces of economics around affordability and but also profit environment, sustainability and decarbonization and politics around security and access. And there is no perfect solution, but what society can and should aspire to is achieving a better balance between these three competing aims of energy policy, because to date society really has focused much more on economics to the detriment, particularly um, of the environment. And the war in Ukraine has now put energy security in the spotlight. Coal output is rising, which impacts our decarbonization efforts and energy prices have increased. And all of that leads to the current energy, global energy crisis, which really is one of competing priorities. And then the question is, or is it a quadrilemma, um, which adds the fourth element of social dimensions of energy. And that focuses on people, on their involvement, and the acceptance of their decisions that the energy industry and policymakers take. And this um, fourth issue really concerns itself with 
providing energy in a just and sustainable way, often referred to as energy justice. It is concerned with identifying when and where injustices occur in energy systems and how best law and policy can respond to them. And it's um, often conceptualized as having three principal tenets around distributional, procedural, and recognition justice, although Indigenous scholars often talk about regenerative and transformational justice as well. And it deals with both the macro justice, which is the societal impacts of energy and how fair and just the institutional decisions are, as well as the micro justice on how individuals are impacted by systemic outcomes. And so instead of thinking of it as another leg on the stool, maybe instead we want to apply the energy justice lens to all of our decisions regarding the energy transition because it does include environmental and social justice components as well so why focus on it well the call for justice in the energy sector has arisen primarily because of the poor management of the sector by policymakers who were really over, overly reliant on advice from neoclassical economists and engineers and the primary focus of economists is on unlimited economic growth, efficiency, competition and costs, and that hasn't really worked for the energy sector. And engineers like to focus on silver bullet technology and uh, always more progress and more high tech and as well as computational models that may well work on complicated issues like rocket science, but really doesn't apply to complex systems like the human energy one. And so continuing um, the fossil fuel industry that is in the process of collapsing our climate system without accounting for the many externalities is also, you know, a, pro a problem, especially with the climate crisis being the greatest energy related externality of all time. And now with the global energy crisis, we really have to ask ourselves if um, energy should be sold as a market commodity instead of enshrined as a universal human right and basic public good, especially seeing it's often funded by public um, tax or ratepayer dollars and subsidies. Um, and we can't look away from the generational traumas and systemic and structural inequities that our history of colonization and slavery and feudalism have caused. And so taking a very middle class paternalistic and Eurocentric approach to energy policy also meant that we are continuing to export and embed those structural injustices around the globe. And that's really to the detriment of all of us. So is a just energy transition that the OECD and the IEA and the World Bank and all these big organizations are dreaming of really possible? Uh, I would say not really under the current economic and socio-political system because we really need a paradigm shift where this energy justice lens, the human and environmental justice do Trump profit thinking at all cost. Um, it's really integral to the energy transition as it addresses the fairness and equity concerns within the current extractive energy system and the future one we want to transition to. And it does incorporate aspects of deep democracy, cooperation and regeneration that feature in this just transition frame. So what are we going to do about this? Um, I thought that this task was only going to have one phase, but then it became clear that we needed to go further in order to really address those underlying causes for energy injustice and the implications for the most marginalized and vulnerable energy users. Because we are currently living through not just a poly crisis, but a permanent one. And it's really scary how interconnected all of these things are and how much the dominoes are starting to fall. Um, the literature also highlights uh, that a lack of social acceptance and the related risks of that at the community level is linked to greater or less extent to issues of fairness and equity. Um, so the global energy crisis, uh, we know about it, we talked about it. Europe managed to avoid the worst last winter, but will um, struggle to a lot of analysts to repeat that feat next winter because a lot of the gas demand saving and therefore the ensuing price decline was due to lack or rather climate change causing warmer weather, the economic damage from COVID and a willingness to, to ignore the climate crisis by switching from coal to gas. Um, Greg Molnar, a gas analyst at the IEA, estimated that 80% of the gas savings last year were due to those non-structural factors and especially the milder weather and that only 20% of the gas savings was due to energy efficiency and behavior change, despite all these massive, you know, um, big national campaigns um, to, you know, change awareness and behaviors. Um, also, LNG, of course, was plentiful because China, China, which was dragged down by the draconian COVID lockdowns, wasn't buying. And then in the UK, of course, we see prices keep going up and up. And I've provided some presentations here if you're interested to hear more 
from um, practitioners on the ground and researchers in the UK, in Portugal, and in remote Indigenous communities in Australia. So building on the lessons that we've learned, what can we do better going forward? Um, terminology really matters. Uh, when we go beyond simple income related definitions of who's hard to reach, then we're not reaching the majority of energy users. Are we really hard? Are we are they really hard to reach? Are we just trying not, not trying hard enough? And we're not trying hard enough to reach them. So we really need to broaden our definitions and eligibility criteria as well as our audience subsegmentations. We need to embrace complexity. We're dealing with really different audiences, all have different barriers, motivations, needs. We need different strategies and solutions. And we need to spend more resources to deeply understand those subsegments of priority audiences rather than just, you know, doling out more light bulbs are the energy efficiency widgets um, at Monton, which is often a solution. Um, we need to look at the hidden segments, understand why are they hidden? Are we not seeing them? Or do they want to remain hidden on purpose? And if so, why? Understanding the lived experience and the complex range of issues that they're dealing with and figuring out where our interventions like energy efficiency, demand response, behavior change can help. And with what? By emphatically listening before we start reflexively fixing. And also we need to find out for whom aren't they hidden, which community and frontline providers and gatekeepers, as well as service providers are known and trusted by them, for whom do they open their doors and pick up the phones. Um, what do we need to do to create trusted relationships with those community navigators without further burdening them. Um, we need to provide them training and energy education where necessary we need to respect their time we need to understand that we sometimes can't use their stories or data because it's not ours to share. Um, and those things um, are often described by researchers as a need to decolonize our thinking and approaches um, to really understand how marginalized communities want to be engaged with, um, understand which subgroups need which cultural approaches, messengers or strategies. And sometimes that means stepping back completely ourselves and just handing this work over to others. And I just want to say that with decolonizing, I, I do not mean to talk about um, only those countries where they're either colonizers or who have been colonized, nor do I talk about in indigenous sovereignty or other sovereignty movements here. I'm talking about the thinking and approaches of how we engage with those who come from different backgrounds to us um, and who have been marginalized and outcast a lot more than us. So um, just very quickly to show a graphic um, idea of what we mean with this complex interaction between energy hardship and being hard to reach and how low income are not really that hard to reach, nor in that much hardship because there are a lot of programs uh, and policies targeted at helping them. Um, so difficulty to engage in increasing hardship really come into place in this hidden um, part of the circle in these hidden demographics. And the outermost hidden circle there in purple are those squeezed middle class households who don't own assets like property and they are really feeling the sting now and they are hidden for several reasons they're hidden psychologically because they cannot yet admit that they are actually becoming the working poor and in danger of losing their middle class stigmas a status and they fear the stigma of that which makes them hard to reach for community groups who are out there helping the poor uh, you need to somewhat self-select for that Behaviorally, they're hard to reach because they're rather reduce or hidden because they're rather reduced, like, you know, they're heating or their energy use or make other adjustments like switching providers or going in prepay or, uh, um, you know, borrowing money from family and family uh, and friends rather than falling into debt. And that makes them hard to reach for industry because they keep paying the bills. And financially, they're, uh, they're hidden to government agencies and other social services because they're usually ineligible for financial support because they often are actually making relatively decent money. Um, but the really big issue are the next three circles of Dante's Inferno, as I call it. And we really want to try and help anyone in the outer circles slipping into these segments as hardship and hard to reach in this compounds really quick, quickly. And those who are marginalized, stigmatized, and even criminalized or illegalized um, are often completely hidden from our approaches. So what are we planning with um, phase two? This is my last slide. Some research questions. Um, 
we want to ask, how is the current energy crisis unfolding in different countries? Um, who's addressing it? Who's affected by it? How are we addressing it? And what are the unintended consequences um, from the, you know, decarbonisation and energy transition efforts in terms of the justice implications? Who are the hard to reach energy users who remain hidden from interventions uh, or are living in hidden hardship? What are the demographics and psychographics barriers and needs? What's the lived experience stories, traditional knowledge around them, et cetera? Who are the navigators and gatekeepers who have trusted relationships with them? Where are they? What are their main barriers? What do they need from us to be part of addressing energy injustice, seeing energy is not usually the field that they're in? How can we improve our methodologies and approaches to engagement with those navigators to achieve better outcomes? Who can we engage? How well do our research process processes and methods really apply here? For example, the use of storytelling and narratives. Um, does following and including traditional ecological knowledge um, like, for example, Kaupapa Māori in New Zealand, who are really um, forerunners in this, improve our research and objective and engagement strategies. And then, of course, what are the cultural country differences and similarities when engaging energy users in hidden hardship in the field? And are there overarching guidelines we can follow? And what are the metrics to best measure progress with those target audiences, including soft benefits? And how can we gain some more cultural acceptance here. And so um, with this, thank you so much for your attention. I hope you've got lots of questions that we can uh, talk about now. We're still looking for partners and co-founders, especially. So if you're interested in doing some of this work with us, please uh, contact me. And I am now going to hand over to Sam very quickly, also just pointing out that the user's TCP is functionally and legally autonomous from the IEA Secretariat. And um, Sam, please take over. Thank you, C. Well, look, a great presentation. And um, of course it draws on the work you've been doing with the TCP for over a decade now. So um, yeah. you've said a lot to say, and um, you know, it's uh, you know, really fantastic work, thank you. Um, but what is the user's TCP? Let me give you a quick breakdown. Well, we're an international research program operating under the auspices of the IEA, so the International Energy Agency, as C says, we're, we're autonomous, um, but we do rely on the IEA for our mandate. Uh, the TCP in our title stands for Technology Collaboration Programme and Users is shorthand for User-Centred Energy Systems. We have 15 member countries across Europe, North America, Asia and Australasia, as well as uh, the Copper Alliance, uh, um, who we partner with to deliver the Academy series. Our mission is to provide evidence from socio-technical research on the design, social acceptance and usability of clean energy technologies to inform policymakers um, in their bid to accelerate the energy transition. And we bring together researchers and policymakers and industry from different disciplines um, to provide that best possible advice uh, to enable uh, better policy making and indeed better decision making amongst our uh, industry and utility groups. Our work is uh, separated out into projects or what we call tasks and we can see our uh, six um, tasks that we have at the moment um, at the bottom of the screen and um, they range really across the socio-technical spectrum. We have a like a behavioral insights platform that's bringing together policymakers to share knowledge on how to apply the lessons from uh, behavioural research uh, for energy and climate policy making. We've got sort of more stuff on the more technical end, for example, our global observatory on peer to peer energy trading, that's go P2P. And, um, you know, we have uh, new work on, uh, again, with policymakers on how to engage the public on energy infrastructure permitting, which is becoming a bigger and bigger issue as the as a transition uh, accelerates. Uh, and super <laughs> academic collaborations around, for example, the intersection of gender and energy and on the social license to automate uh, demand side flexibility. Um, one thing before I hand over to Hans for the Q&A, we're just kicking off a new task. That's what you can see in the top right hand corner of your screen on the effectiveness of mass marketing campaigns. So the exact opposite, really, of what C's been talking today about the sort of more resource intensive, hard to reach interventions. Um, but of course, with the energy crisis, mass marketing campaigns have really moved up the policy agenda over the last year. And we want to draw lessons from those campaigns 
uh, that have been put in place since the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And uh, so we're providing a platform with the International Energy Agency Secretariat um, for campaign designers to share knowledge, tips and lessons learned over the last year and over the coming winter heating season in the Northern Hemisphere to provide them with that platform to share uh, information in real time over the coming months. So an exciting new development. We're actually kicking it off today. Um, and with that, I will hand back over to Hans. Thank 